Hello, my name is Carrie Cottle and welcome to Read Aloud with Ms. Cottle. Today we are reading the beautiful book, Waiting for High Tide. Enjoy. Waiting for High Tide by Nikki McClure. Published by Abrams Books for Young Readers. Waiting for High Tide. I close my eyes and open them, close and open. Still low tide, I squint and wait. There is a big stretch of mud between me and the water's edge. I want to swim, but I just get muddy, or worse, I get stuck and grandma would have to rescue me. It seems like I spend every day all hot summer long waiting for the water to creep back over the mud. I'm not alone. Crabs under rocks, clams and worms burrowed deep, barnacles closed tight. They wait for high tide too. It takes six hours for the water to rise from low tide to high tide. That's a long time. I want to swim now. Instead, I sit and wait. But it's not going to be so bad today. Today, we are going to build a raft. We found a big log drifting loose after a storm and towed it to our beach. Last night, we cut it up into three sections. I had to stuff my fingers in my ears when Papa started the chainsaw. The three smaller logs were too heavy to move with our hands alone. While the tide was high, Papa rolled the logs into the water using a PV as a lever. The logs floated. We easily lined them up side by side. The tide went out and now the logs sit on the beach waiting to become a raft. Mama and Papa, even Grandma, are here to help. We're not the only ones ready to work this morning. Crows scan the morning high tide line for useful tidbits. I follow them. The sea provides, Mama says. The beach always has what you need. Maybe today there is pirate treasure. I find one fine long pole, four clamshells, miscellaneous crab parts, three dead jellyfish, green and brown seaweeds that pop, curved pieces of bark perfect to float and sink with a volley of rocks, a bedraggled heron wing feather, a tiny bits of yellow plastic rope, a soggy shoe that does not match any in my collection, a true score, sunglasses with one lens gone and the other covered with barnacles. Now I have barnacle vision. Oh, I have to get real glasses to help me see. I don't want to wear glasses. I can see fine enough. I can see everything on this beach. Is the tide coming in? I put on my barnacle glasses and I still can't see from here. I step light and quick across the mud, taking a bridge of crushed clamshells out to piles of barnacle covered rock exposed by the low tide. I call the biggest pile Big Crab Island. The smallest pile is Little Crab Island. Peeking under a rock, I spy a hundred crabs that rustle and scurry to hide. They prefer to wait for high tide in cool shadow safety. Mama says that the rock piles are from ships that came here long ago. The sailors would dump the ballast of rocks and then fill the hull and decks with a heavy cargo of logs from the forests. The timber became the ship's ballast, steadying it for the sea journey home. The logs were used to build cities all along the Pacific coast. The crabs made their own city under the rocks left behind. Look, with my barnacle vision, I can see that the tide isn't waiting for me. Soon, Big Crab Island will, will really be an island before it disappears underwater. I dash back across the mud to higher ground. Muddy, but with both shoes still on, I start work on the raft. 
I haul the fine long pole I found over to Papa and he cuts it into three fine short poles and lays them across the logs. Mama marks where they line up on the logs. Notches need to be chopped here. The poles will fit in the grooves. We will then tie the poles to the logs to hold the raft together. With two hands on my hatchet's handle, and my legs safely out of the way, I swing down and chop into the first log. Chop, chip, chop, chip, chop. Three notches done, and I need a rest. I pass the hatchet over to Mama, who gives a few chops and chips of her own. I walk along a ribbon of barnacles that stripes the upper beach. They cover the big rocks here that the waves can't tumble. When barnacles are young, they swim all over as part of the plankton that drift in the sea. They have only one eye, just like my barnacle glasses. With it, they look for other barnacles. When they find them, they settle down and cement their heads to something solid and barnacly. Rocks, docks, lost sunglasses, and there they stay. During low tide, the rocky beach gets hot and dry, but barnacles don't care. Their tough shells close tight and they can breathe whether they're in or out of the water. At high tide, barnacles feed. Tiny plates open and feathered siri, their legs swoop out to catch plankton. Yes, little swimming barnacles too. I could stare at them for hours and have the water cover me and still sit there watching them. But the best part about barnacles is the noise they make. Miles and miles of tiny plates shifting about make a crackly, squizzling sound. Maybe they tell stories of all they saw with that one eye as they swam about in the world. What will I see? What stories will I tell? But first, I need to work. I take my hatchet and chop, chip, chop, chip. The tide creeps in little by little. I chop and chip and listen to the gulls squawking, food, food, food. I call out, food, and then add, please, so my parents don't fly away. From Mama's handy picnic basket, I unpack peanut butter sandwiches, cold mint tea, and sweet watermelon. We eat and talk and watch the gulls being followed relentlessly by their awkward gray young. They know that the incoming tide means food. There are hidden treats under the mud. Hungry, unseeing clams dig up from the mud to feed on plankton in the rising water. Gulls walk the water line looking for them. Muddy beaks pry up the blackened shells. Some gulls take a clam and fly in circles over the rocks, hover and drop the shell. Crack! They flutter down to eat the soft clam inside before another gull swoops in. Other gulls take a clam in beak and waddle up the shore. Nothing to see here, folks. Then they hit the shell once, twice, up to six times on a rock to crack it open. When the clam inside is eaten, they waddle back to dig up more. Everyone is feasting, clam, gull, human, and all the life in the mud too small to see or fathom. The tide creeps higher and the barnacles start to feed. Underwater, fish called sculpins zip about and crabs clean clam bits from gull broken shells. A heron calmly lifts a leg high and cocks his head to one side, waiting for a sculpin to move. 
a sudden dart of a sharp beak into the water. Then he shakes his head and goes back to the silent stare and patient walk along the shore. How long will the sculpin lie still, camouflaged like a rock? This sculpin is willing to wait a bit more for the tide to come in and the water to deepen. A boat goes by and its wake rolls along the beach. The tide is rising. I put my sandwich down to finish chopping. Mama sets poles across the notches I cut. Papa digs holes under the logs at each crossing point. Then he threads rope under and over the logs, under and over, under and over, and lashes the poles to the logs. If we nailed them together, the nails would snap as the logs rolled through white-capped winter storms and summers full of wild kids diving off all at the same time. Mama wedges a pry bar under the pole so Papa can pull even tighter. He then ties a knot. I chop the last knot. Our raft is almost done. We need the tide to rise a bit higher before we can push the raft into the water. And we need a plank. I scout through piles of driftwood heaved up all winter and spy a board just the right size. A raft needs a plank for us to dive off of or be forced to walk by swimmers turned pirates. I drag the thick board over and Papa lashes it on. The raft is ready, the tide is not. So we nibble cookies and wait. A kingfisher rattles a warning to all fish in the sea and plunges into the water. Up he flies with a stickleback trapped in his beak, his weight over. The tide keeps rising. Big Crab Island is well underwater. Crabs explore and feed freely. The mud flats are underwater. Clams are safe from observant gulls. Sculpins swim, patrolling the mud for food. Maybe it is time. I've waited so long. I want to dive. I want to swim. I put on my barnacle glasses and take a peek. The water is now only a foot away. I could wait for the water to lift the raft, but I've already waited all day. I grab a chunk of bark and start digging under the logs. Help, help, I call. It will take more than me to get this raft moving. Mama, Papa, and even Grandma grab shovels and sticks and start digging to clear away for the water under the raft. Water creeps under the first log, settling tiny stones and filling the space. I keep digging, tiny bits of clamshells and sand fly. Papa finds a stout pole in the driftwood stores. He tries to lever the raft down the beach just a bit to ride in the deepening water. He tries and tries. We all push, and maybe the raft shifts an inch, maybe not. It's just too heavy. It is crazy to think we can move this raft. But with each push, we imagine that this is the push that will make the raft slip into the rising water. Crows circle, seals chasing fish stop to watch this with shiny eyes. An eagle laughs overhead, a breath of rest, and then we all push as hard as we can. And the raft moves, another push and it gives way. The raft is floating. I hop on board and the raft sways. Papa grabs some paddles and everyone climbs on board. Kicking, splashing, laughing, we paddle the raft out to where it will be moored, just next to Big Crab Island over the mudflats. 
Papa ties the raft to an anchored buoy with a chain. Where he got this, I don't know. He is magic. The day of waiting is over. The water quiets around us. Bubbles in our wake pop and fade. And whoops, here we all are. Mama, Papa, Grandma, and me on the raft with only one way back to shore. I take the first cannonball off the raft, followed by giant splashes. We swim ashore with paddles, with pants and shirts and hats and crazy smiling faces. We waited for high tide, here it is. We turn back and swim out to the raft and then jump off again and again and again. Papa holds onto his glasses when he jumps so he doesn't lose them. I don't have to worry about that yet. My barnacle glasses enjoy the plunge. I think I can hear the barnacles happily feeding. I let the glasses drift off my face and sink to the bottom. Tomorrow, I won't be able to find them. They will be gone, but the raft will still be here, ready for me when the tide is high. I'll be waiting. to Finn and all swimmers of the Salish Sea. Author's note, we really did build a raft one summer. It's named the Leaky Contiki for Thor Heyerdahl's intrepid vessel, and it has survived a few winters and summers. Now barnacles and mussels and even plumos and anemones coat the undersides and filter the water as we swim about. Otters, herons, and ducks like to rest on it, and even grandma. Once we lay on it so long that the tide went out under us and we walked off across the mud. The raft floats at the southern end of the Salish Sea near Olympia, Washington. You can find it on a map and look up the tide to see when it's high. P.S. Yes, it is my hatchet. Please ask me before you use it very careful with it and expect you to be the same. The rules are two hands on the hatchet at all times, legs out of the way, and that you must always put it away carefully after using it and never leave it outside. If you leave it outside, I will never let you use my hatchet again. And lastly, the illustrations in this book were made by cutting black paper with an X-Acto knife. I also use a fountain pen. That was waiting for high tide. I love the ocean. I love the sound of the waves. I love the power of the enormity of it all. But there are some things that I learned in this book, even though I've just loved the ocean for my whole life. Like I didn't know that barnacles made sounds. And I just sort of got I don't know, immersed in this book as I experienced it through the eyes of this child, this child waiting for that high tide and learning that every six hours it comes all the way in and goes all the way back out. And that this family is a part of this whole community, this ecosystem here, right at the edge of the ocean. You know, you might not live near the ocean, but I bet there are some natural experiences right near you that you could really notice too and if you do have a chance to get to the ocean get there and take a moment to just breathe look listen be be there in nature be a part of it and experience it and delight in playing there and also notice who lives there all the time <laughs> take care of each other